From ancient civilizations all the way to the modern era, numbers have played a crucial role in shaping our understanding of the world. Join me in this video as we delve into the fascinating story of how the need to solve society problems as well as invent cutting-edge technologies led to the evolution and introduction of different number systems from one-dimensional counting numbers all the way to four-dimensional quaternions used in modern computer graphics and even more. So, to set stage for this video, let's begin by asking the question, why did humans invent numbers in the first place? Well, the world's greatest innovations have either been out of curiosity or out of the need to solve a society problem, and numbers are no exception. From the earliest civilizations, humans have recognized the need to count and quantify objects. From historical findings, we know that the Egyptians Mesopotamians and a few other ancient cultures developed numerical systems that laid foundation for modern mathematics. And because counting and quantifying objects was one of the earliest problems in society, counting numbers, or natural numbers as we sometimes call them, were the first practical numbers to be invented. Now in this video, I will use the word number types and number systems interchangeably. I understand they might be technically different, but I just couldn't find a better term. Counting numbers are just numbers starting from 1, 2, 3 and so on. Notice that these numbers did not include 0 at first, and that's because counting was mainly restricted to physical objects, so there was no need to count nothing. Therefore, 0 was not part of the earliest number systems to be invented, the counting numbers. Of course, the symbols 1, 2, 3, and so on were invented later. It should be no surprise that these ancient mathematicians could have used different symbols to represent these numbers. But to keep everything simple in this video, I'll stick to one of the most recognized symbols, the Hindu Arabic numerals. I'll also be using the modern standard algebraic notation as we know it. Back to counting numbers, you can imagine how hard it was to have a number system that did not include zero. As an example, think about the temperature of melting ice. How would you represent it using only the counting number? Of course, you cannot say the temperature is nothing. It's got to be something. And that something has to have a number to represent it. And that's zero. Well, technically speaking, zero wasn't a number when it was first introduced. It was more like a placeholder to distinguish numbers like 205 from 25, and that was much better than just leaving a space or just using a dot. Adapting zero into the available numbers led to the birth of a new type of numbers, the whole numbers as we know them today. These were simply an extension of the natural numbers to include a zero. These numbers can only be used to describe objects as wholes. For example, one person, three cars, five people, hence the name whole numbers. Much as whole numbers can be used to describe a wide range of scenarios, they still had one problem. They are one-sided. They cannot represent the opposite side of things. Take an example. Climbing stairs and descending down the stairs are two equal but opposite scenarios. And there is a whole lot of scenarios like this in real life. Borrowing and lending, growth and decay. I mean, the list is endless. How do we represent such in mathematics? So the idea was simple. For every natural number, let's have another number on the opposite side of the number line. Let's put a minus sign on the other side. We call one side the positive and the other side the negative. 
and there we have it, integers were born. But let's take a step back. Do you remember those whole numbers, the ones we use to represent whole objects? But what about situations in real life where we want to represent parts of objects rather than whole objects? For example, when an orange is cut into two parts, we can't say we have two oranges, since an orange has to be a whole object. This example shows the need for numbers between integers. And that's where fractions and decimals come into play. Fractions allow us to express parts of a whole number such as halves, thirds and so on. Decimals are just a more precise way of representing a fraction using a denominator that is more relatable. Most decimals we use today are in the best 10 system, which means they are basically fractions where the denominator is 10 or a multiple of 10, like 100, 1000, and so on. In fact, decimals can include a whole number part and a fraction part put together. For example, 1.5, 3.6 are examples of decimals. Now in order to generalize this, all numbers that can be written in the form of a over b, where b of course is not equal to zero, are called rational numbers, since technically a divided by b is a ratio of a to b. At this point, it's important to recognize that every new type of numbers that was invented was a superset of all the number types that came before it. Whole numbers contain all natural numbers, Integers contain all whole numbers, and rational numbers contain all integers. Now, so far so good, we have the rational numbers. But is it possible that there are numbers that cannot be expressed as ratios? Well, take an example. If you have a square of sides one unit, what would be the length of its diagonal? Using Pythagoras' theorem, we can find this diagonal to be the square root of 2. This number cannot be expressed as a ratio. It's a perfect example of what we call irrational numbers, technically because it's not rational, so it's irrational. This forms another group of numbers that are uniquely neither a superset nor a subset of all the previous number types. By the late 1800s, the real number system was well defined and formalized to contain all the previous types of numbers from counting numbers all the way to irrational numbers. Now at this point, it seemed like mathematicians had discovered all numbers that there is. But there are some problems that could still not be solved using the real number system that was well developed at this time. Take an example, how do we solve the equation x squared plus 4 equals 0? Well, by collecting like terms, we can simplify this to x squared equals negative 4. And to find x, we have to take the square root of negative 4. Now, the square root of negative 4 cannot be negative 2 or positive 2, because if we square both of these numbers, we actually get positive 4 and not negative 4. The square root of negative 4 is neither positive nor negative. To solve such problems, mathematicians introduced the imaginary unit i as the square root of negative 1. So the way this works is that you split the square root into two parts, so the square root of negative 4 can be written as the square root of negative 1 times the square root of positive 4, and of course the square root of positive 4 is just a 2, and the square root of negative 1 by definition is the imaginary unit i, so the square root of negative 4 becomes 2i. 2i is an example of what for a long time was called an imaginary number. The notation of using i was popularized by mathematician Leonard Euler in the 18th century, but the term imaginary had been used nearly a hundred years before by Rene Descartes as he considered these numbers fictitious and useless. Now if we add a real number and an imaginary number, we get a two-dimensional number otherwise known as a complex number, a number that is made up of two parts that live in completely different worlds. Complex numbers have a real and imaginary part, which means a single number can be represented on a two-dimensional plane. 
We call that an Agan diagram or the complex plane. Complex numbers were a superset of all the number types that came before them. I mean, if you think about it, every number can be represented as a complex number if we let the imaginary part or the real part to be equal to zero. Complex numbers have completely revolutionized many areas of research. They show up in a number of models in physics, engineering, economics, and more. It's hard to imagine a world without complex numbers. That's because they show up even in our best explanations of the universe and the world around us. For example, the Schrodinger equation. In engineering, complex numbers are used to study and investigate alternating current circuits to better understand the behavior of electrical systems and design efficient circuits. In physics, complex numbers play a crucial role in understanding wave phenomena. From analyzing electromagnetic waves to studying quantum mechanics, complex numbers are just indispensable, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. But is that all? Are complex numbers all there is? Well, it turns out not. As Albert Einstein once said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Mysterious as the world around us is, brilliant minds have over time tried to make sense of it. Genius minds continued to push the boundaries of numbers uncovering new types of numbers that span higher dimensions. These numbers are called higher dimensional algebras or hypercomplex numbers, and they continue to be subject for study and research even to this day. By the 19th century, people had a clear understanding of number systems and algebra, and they had studied the legitimacy of symbolic operations. But there was one problem yet to be solved. Mathematicians were still searching for three-dimensional numbers. Among these was an Irish mathematician, Sir William Rowan Hamilton. For Hamilton, three-dimensional numbers seemed to be an obvious and natural tool for solving three-dimensional problems like in geometry and physics. Now the challenge wasn't just about inventing new numbers. For these numbers to be practically useful, an arithmetic system to manipulate them has to be developed, some form of algebra, and that's where the problem was. After more than a decade of failed attempts, on October the 16th of 1843, while walking with his wife beside the Royal Canal on his way to Dublin, Hamilton suddenly realized that while the algebra of three-dimensional numbers was impossible, at least multiplication was possible for four-dimensional numbers. These numbers would go on to acquire the name quaternions, and they are the first of a general category of what we now call hypercomplex numbers, numbers that are beyond the complex number system. Thrilled by his inspiration, history tells us that Hamilton stopped to carve the fundamental equations of this algebra on a stone of a bridge they were passing. There is even a famous writing to this date that reads the following. Here as he walked on the 16th of October 1843, Sir William Rowan Hamilton, in a flash of a genius, discovered the fundamental formula for quaternion multiplication. I squared equals J squared equals K squared equals I, J, K equals negative one. Quaternions are represented by this bold letter H and are basically created by adding two more dimensions to the normal complex number, the J and K dimensions. With inspiration from Hamilton, John T. Graves in December of 1843 discovered that the algebra of eight-dimensional numbers were possible. These eight-dimensional numbers are what we now call the octonions, represented with a bold letter O. Octonions were independently discovered by another mathematician, Arthur Cayley, about the same time as John Graves. In 1919, Arthur Cayley and Leonard Dixon showed that it was possible to take any algebra with involution 
and basically create another algebra of twice the dimension. With this discovery, it seemed possible to create any form of high dimensional algebra and all sorts of hyper complex numbers. But not so fast. At a good guess, I think majority of the people watching this video have never heard of hyper complex numbers. And that's because of a few reasons. Here's one. As you increase the dimensions, you lose some nice properties like order, commutativity, associativity, and more, which makes such numbers hard to work with for most practical and abstract applications. So while it's theoretically possible to create high dimensional numbers beyond quaternions and octonions, it turns out that octonions are the largest normed division algebra that you can form. But beyond octonions, division by zero is possible and this creates a lot of weird situations which we definitely don't want to get into. So just in case you're curious whether higher dimensional numbers beyond octonions exist, the answer is Yes, they do exist, but they just have fewer practical applications, at least as of now. One more question before we end the video. Who needs hyper-complex numbers anyway? Well, higher dimensional algebras and hyper-complex numbers are applied in advanced fields especially those that deal with complex systems and multidimensional phenomena. Scientists, engineers, and researchers working in areas of physics, computer graphics, robotics, and 3D modeling benefit greatly from these mathematical tools. By understanding and utilizing hyper-complex numbers and higher dimensional algebras, experts in these fields are able to tackle complex problems and push the boundaries of technological advancements and innovation. In the beginning, it was just a simple problem of counting. As society continues to advance, we will need more robust and powerful tools and techniques. Mathematics has already been pushing beyond the limits of what our ancestors could ever think of. And this is just the beginning. Hey there, it's Dennis here. Now, I hope this video sparked your interest to learn more about the weird and interesting world of numbers. This video is proudly sponsored by viewers like you. By clicking this video, you help me create more content like this. If you want to support me more, you can visit my Patreon page. The link is in the description. Thanks for watching. Stay curious and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.